All right, last chunk of chapter five. Uh, we're going to go over pedigrees and sort of the types of pedigree problems that your book and I are going to pose and how to work through them. So uh, let's take a look at just some of the terminology here, our commonly used symbols. Okay, so we have um, sort of a generation here and it's indicated with a Roman numeral. Okay, and then each person within that generation is indicated with a uh, Arabic numeral. The horizontal line between them, so over here, meaning that there are a couple. We use the squares to indicate male and the circles to indicate female. And then uh, we're going to show our offspring here with the vertical line coming down from the couple and then splitting off into if we have multiple offspring or just be down uh, to a single person if it's one offspring. And then uh, color doesn't matter, but a filled in either square or circle means that that person is affected by the genetic disorder. Okay. And then sometimes there's a little like um, arrow indicating the, what we call the proband, the person that say is having this pedigree analysis done, or maybe the person we're asking the question about. Okay. So uh, same here, the, these are kind of another way to predict, although in this case, um, we're, we're trying to predict the, 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 possibility that say someone in generation two will have a genetic disorder. So we're kind of doing quick Punnett squares in our heads. All right. So if we see <clears throat> someone say over here that a child has a disorder, but the parents are not expressing it from that, we can infer that the um, parents are heterozygous. Each one is heterozygous and that that child here, the one that got affected has this recessive trait. Okay. So if we see a um, child of affected child with unaffected parents, we can infer that the trait is recessive. Now over here, we've got uh, an affected parent ends up having an affected child. Okay. So in this case, we uh, know that this person must be recessive uh, for the disease. And then we can infer that uh, the, this other person, this other parent, has a uh, possibility for, for their children having the disease. So they must be a heterozygote. So we're kind of filling in the blanks. It's like putting in a big puzzle uh, for uh, which parent has what genotype based on what their children's genotypes are as well. So here we're going to try to solve the pedigree. Uh, we know information of three generations back and we want to know about this particular cross between we call them a Roman numeral 3-1 and Roman numeral 3-2. What is the probability that the child will be affected by the genetic trait that's in both families? Okay, so we're gonna kind of go along and solve this like a puzzle. It's really helpful to have these written out or be able to mark them up in some way so you can sort of know who is what where. So first we want to figure out, is this trait dominant or recessive uh, as we're filling in our pedigrees? And based on these two groups right here, this fact we have two unaffected parents with an affected child over on that side and two unaffected parents with an affected child over here, we're going to have to say, yeah, this is probably a recessive trait here, very likely. Okay. So now we're going to fill in all the genotypes that we know. So if anybody is affected, we're going to assign them the homozygous recessive uh, genotype. Okay. We can fill in these parents here that we're pretty sure must have a recessive allele in order to have those kids. Okay. That's sort of the fill in what we know information. Next, um, we're going to have to, there's a chance here whether or not this person is affected. Okay. Now we know how this usually goes that uh, if we've got the two heterozygotes crossing that we have a um, phenotypically, let's see how they want to do this here. Okay, they want to do the genotype. Okay, we know that the person can't be uh, recessive for this trait. So there's really only three options or two options. Okay, they can either be homozygous dominant or they can be uh, heterozygous. Okay, and so we're looking for whether or not this kid way down here can have the trait. So we're curious what's the probability that they have they're a heterozygote. Okay, and that probability is going to be two out of three. So we'll mark that there. So we're two thirds sure that they can be heterozygous. Over here, um, this is interesting. They're making the assumption that since this person married into the family, that they don't have the trait of um, uh, this particular genetic disease. So if this happens in a question um, 
I will try to tell you, I'll give you this so you don't have to make that assumption. Okay. And now we're going to look at, uh, let's see, 2-2 two -two here. What is the chance that this person has the trait of interest or is a heterozygote? <clears throat> so again, uh, since the parents are both heterozygotes, there's that two-third chance that they are also a heterozygote. And then finally, this person over here <clears throat> is if they have these parents, if this person is um, heterozygous and this one is homozygous dominant, they now have a one in three chance of them being um, uh, heterozygous. Okay. So, because he's got a half chance there. And so how do, what about this person way down here? We want to solve for this individual Roman numeral three dash one. Okay. So if both parents are heterozygous, because there's a chance they could be, then there is a one quarter chance that the child will be affected. Okay. So both parents must be A over A and must each donate an allele. So we've got uh, a one third chance of the father here and a two third chance of the mother here and there's just a one quarter chance if all that happens so that we calculate out to be a two over 36 or a one out of 18 chance overall that this child will be affected by the genetic disease. Okay. So just to go back a little bit when we're talking about these um, alleles and where phenotypes come from in a sense. So we're getting all the way back to how um, enzymes function. And so if we're looking at our round peas here, uh, there's an enzyme that actually helps um, branch starch molecules so that starch molecules get kind of like big and puffy and make amylopectin. And that accumulates in the peas and sort of puff up and you get these nice round peas full of um, starchy goodness. Okay. Whereas in the wrinkled gene, you actually have a broken uh, starch branching enzyme. It's a, it's a, a nonsense mutation with a um, non-functional enzyme and so this type of starch does not accumulate and the peas don't fill out with starch and you get a wrinkled pea thing. So all these phenotypes are talking about genetic diseases and um, recessive traits all go back to what DNA is coding for, okay, what enzymes are being made and what's happening in the gene expression in the cell. And just another point they put in here in a communicating genetics box about how to describe various uh, multiple alleles, which we'll get to in a later chapter, but just um, sometimes the uh, um, names for the different multiple alleles get a little wonky and tricky. But it was in this chapter. We're going to do definitely more on this later. Okay. See you in chapter six.